Let's turn over to the book of Hebrews, chapter 9. How many of you, this is the first service that you've made during these meetings? Could I see your hand? Man, we still got a lot of new people here. Well, I hadn't got time to go back and summarize everything, but um, please get the CDs or the DVDs from the previous meetings. And let me just real quickly say that I started talking, first of all, about who God is. And I showed that God is not the one who puts problems on us. He does not sovereignly control this earth. He gave control of this earth to people. People turned it over to the devil and Satan has been causing hardship and pain and death in this earth ever since. And God will intervene, but he always has to have a person to intervene through. So it is wrong the way that religion is taught that God is sovereign. I'm not against sovereignty if you use it the way the dictionary defines it, but the way religion is defined it to say that he controls everything is wrong and it takes away your resistance towards the devil. I mean, after all, if God allowed it, well, then God is somewhat responsible. You'd be fighting against God and it makes people passive. And that's how Satan takes advantage of us. Satan cannot do anything to you. This is something you... Most of you are going to choke on this or either just ignore it because it sounds too good to be true. But Satan can't do anything to you without your consent and cooperation. That is an absolute truth. And if you understood that and realized it's the devil that's trying to steal, kill, and destroy, and if you resist the devil, the Bible says he'll flee from you. So you've got to recognize God is not the author of your problems. And then we talked about... The difference between the way God dealt with people in the old covenant and the way he dealt with people in the new covenant and showed you that all of God's wrath was placed on Jesus and now sin is not really an issue between you and God. And I could be stoned to death for saying that by a lot of Christians. Because to Christians, sin is still the focus of everything. The whole life is about how to overcome And struggle with sin and how can I live holy and stuff. And yet Jesus has solved the sin issue. He's paid for all of your sins. He's not mad at you. He put all of your punishment upon Jesus. And there is nothing left for you to pay. Does that mean that you go live in sin? No, because sin still has a consequence. Satan gains inroad into your life every time you rebel at God and go out and live in sin. So... There are consequences and you will suffer if you live in sin, but it's not coming from God. It's because you allowed the devil in. So as much as you can, you need to live holy, but none of us are going to do things perfectly. Your conscience is always going to show you that you've come short. And if you think that God is rejecting you, not answering your prayers because you aren't living as holy as you should, then you are never going to have complete faith in God's intervention, because you're never going to be perfect until we go to be with the Lord. Man, that is a powerful, powerful truth. And then last night I talked about the thing that God used to just literally change my life. And that's spirit, soul, and body, that it's in your spirit that you are now changed. The spirit part of you is the real you. The body part of you is just your vehicle that you get around in. It's similar to a car. It's necessary And it's how you get from place to place, but it's not you. If you have a wreck and if you come out of it alive and well and you lost your car, you shouldn't be broken hearted. You ought to be praising God. Amen. It's just that vehicle that I get around in. This is just my earth suit. This is what allows me to function in this world, but this is not the real me. And my mental emotional part is not the real me. I had a woman out there saying there's two two parts of me. One part wants to do this and the other part wants to do this. And I said, well, that part over there is the flesh, the soul. This part is the spirit. Ignore that one and focus on this one. And some people think, I just can't do this. This is how I feel. Well, it's the lost part of you. Did you know what? Not all of you saved. Because when you get saved, you become a new creature. Old things pass away. All things become new. That's not true of your physical body. Your physical body is not transformed. We have scriptures that say it's going to be changed in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye. And you're going to become a brand new person that no longer is subject to sickness and disease or anything. You'll be able to zip from place to place, walk through walls the way Jesus did. We have a glorified body that has been purchased, but it's not redeemed. Your body's not redeemed. 
You know, it's like S and H green stamps. I had somebody give me some of those this week because I've used this example before, but those of you who are older, when you were, when we were kids, my mother would buy something at the grocery store. They'd give you the green stamps. You'd post them in a book and then you'd go to a redemption center where you would trade these stamps in and you'd get lamps or, you know, furniture or anything. Uh, you could go get these things with these stamps, trading stamps. But see, you had them purchased, you had them in your hand, but what you wanted wasn't the stamps. You wanted to go redeem them and get something. Well, God has purchased your body and you have the promise that you are getting a glorified body, but it's not redeemed yet. We are still waiting on the redemption of our body is what the scripture says. And your soul's not redeemed yet. Your soul is the mental, emotional part of you. And you are going to, it says 1 Corinthians 13, that when we get to heaven, we will know all things, even as also we are known. You will know everything. You don't know everything right now in your little peanut brain right here. Some of you can't remember where you left your keys. You don't know everything right here, but we are going to get a new soul that will know everything, everything. There'll be nothing that we don't know. That's not happened yet. It's been purchased, but it's not redeemed. The only part of you that's saved is your spirit. Your spirit is as perfect right now as it will be in eternity. It know it has the mind of Christ, 1 Corinthians uh, 2 16. You have been renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created you. Colossians 3 10. 1 John chapter 2 verse 20. We have an unction from the Holy One and we know all things. That's not true of your mind. It's true of your spirit. In your spirit, your spirit knows everything. Your spirit salvation is complete. There is no sickness. You have the same healing. This is what we were talking about last night. And this just transformed my life. Basically, I changed my identity. I quit thinking that this is me. And if I have a pain, I don't sit there and say, oh man, I'm suffering and I have a pain. No, that's my body is struggling, but the real me is healed and I have authority over this and I can sit there and ignore that pain. I can resist that pain. I can make my body change. When I feel discouraged, and there's times that I don't always feel encouraged, but I've learned that it doesn't matter how I feel in the spirit. I have love, joy, and peace. I witnessed to a guy in Charlotte one time who spit a big old wad of chewing tobacco right in my face and it dripped all down my shirt. And you know what? My soul didn't want to bless him. (laughs) My soul wanted to punch this guy's lights out. But I knew that in my spirit, I'm exactly like Jesus. What would Jesus do? Well, Jesus, he endured their spitting and their insults and stuff. And so I know what the scripture says Jesus would do. And you know what? I was able to wipe that off and keep loving this guy. I never missed a word in my sentence and just kept talking to him and I didn't affect me. That is not the way my soul would have operated. And some people see would say, well, I just couldn't be a hypocrite. I just can't act like something I'm not. This is how I feel. Well, you are a hypocrite. Because see, it all depends on what your identity is. You think the soul is the real you. And so you're going to act like that soul feels. No, the real you is the born again part. That's the part of you that say, and you, that ought to be your identity. And you ought to say, I've got the same love and compassion that Jesus has. How could I be a hypocrite to who I am in the spirit and just indulge my feelings and punch this guy's lights out or yell at him or say something? You're hypocritical when you indulge your feelings. (laughs) That's a new wrinkle in a lot of people's brains. No, no, this is, this is how I feel. That's because you don't know who you are in Christ. And you've got to literally get so focused on who you are in Christ that you change your identity and you become who Jesus says you are and not what you feel like. You know, when the Lord first showed me this, I was getting revelation of it, but it was so contrary to everything. I didn't know anybody. I've never, I'd never heard another person in my life say these things ever. There was no confirmation and it was so radical that I struggled with it. And I literally remember standing in front of a mirror. I did this lots of times. 
And I would preach it myself and point my finger and look myself eyeball to eyeball and say, you are righteous. You are forgiven. In the spirit, you do love this person. And I would just talk to myself and tell myself who I was. And I know some of you think that's weird, but you know what? That's what it took for me to get beyond what I felt and change my identity. And I had to force myself to say, this is not who I am. I refuse to go by what I feel. I refuse to go by these things. In Christ, I am complete. There is not a part of me that's suffering and mad, upset, anything. In the spirit, I've always got love, joy, and peace. And I've just learned to train myself that this is who I am and this is how I'm going to act. If you come up and ask me how I am, I'm going to tell you I'm blessed. And I don't care how I feel. I've had people say, well, I know you say that, but how are you really And I say, I really am blessed. Amen. (laughs) They say, well, I want to know how you feel. I say, I don't care how I feel. This is how I am. This is who I am. And this is how I live. And it's changed my life. You know what? I told you last night, but I'm an introvert by nature. This is something I don't in, in the natural enjoy doing. It's contrary to my nature. If I win how I feel... Uh, there's times that I'd just leave, (laughs) (laughs) but you know what? I know I'm a new person and I know God's called me and anointed me and I've learned to live out of who I am in Christ. And I can do things through Christ that I couldn't do in myself. And I tell you, some people look at that and think, well, that's just strange. You're suppressing how you feel. You're in denial. And they think that's bondage. You know what I think's bondage is to indulge every carnal thought and feeling that you have and let it rule you. And you know that the Bible says you can lay hands on the sick and you shall recover, but I don't feel a tingling in my hand. I just don't feel it. And so I can't do it. You're in bondage. You are in bondage to your feelings. People are going to treat you badly. I don't know if you figured this out yet. <laughs> But people will treat you badly. And if you are just, if you are just going to let physical circumstances and situations dominate how you feel, then you are going to be one messed up person. And you're going to have very few times that you're up here where everything's just wonderful and stuff because we live in a fallen world. If nothing else, did you know what? Every last one of us is in the process of dying. Some of you may not like that. And you know, I'm, I'm not dying. I'm healthy. You know what? You are in the process of dying. If the Lord tarries, every one of us is going to die. And if all there was is a physical realm, and if you just thought about stuff like that and thought about it at your best day, it's just temporary. You're going to get old. You will die and leave this life. And if, if we didn't have the knowledge of heaven and all of these other things, and if you just thought about that, that's enough to get you depressed. Life's terminal. I saw a bumper sticker that says, if you aren't disturbed, you aren't paying attention. And you know what? In the natural realm, that's true. In the natural realm, things are going from good to bad in a hurry. There's a lot to be upset about. But you know what? You've got the spirit, who you are in Christ and all of these promises that no weapon that will formed against you. And it just depends on what you're focused on. If you're focused on the natural realm, you're going to be depressed. But if you're focused on who you are in Christ, it will literally insulate you against all of this. You know what? I have talked way too much about all that. Have you found Hebrews chapter 9 yet? If you haven't found it, you might as well look on the screen. You aren't going to get there, amen. But the reason I want to use these verses is because some people say, all right, I can see that when I got born again, I became a new person in Christ Jesus, and this is the way I was. But I've sinned since then. And most people have the concept that when you get born again, God gives you a brand new start. You'll even hear songs about, man, it's a new beginning. God has given you a new start. You get a chance to just do it all over again. That is not the Christian life. If all it was was a new start, I could prophesy over you that you'd mess up your second start just as bad as you messed up your first start. (laughs) Salvation isn't just a new chance to try it over again because you're going to blow it again. 
true Christianity is an exchanged life, not just a changed life. It's an exchanged life. You now have God living on the inside of you and his purity and his goodness, and it can never be corrupted. You didn't just get forgiven up to that point. And now if you go out and mess up, you lose everything. You're contaminated again. See, this is the way most Christians think. And they think that every time you sin after you're a Christian, it's a new offense against God. You've got to run to God and get it forgiven to get back into fellowship with our relationship with God. That is not true. That is not what the word of God teaches. I wish I had time to put the whole book of Hebrews in context because this is the point that he's making. He's trying to help people transition from the Hebrew way of doing things, the Old Testament, into the New Testament. It was written to the legalistic Jews. And it constantly is saying that Jesus is the greatest revelation and that now the priesthood is changed, that we don't offer the sacrifices. We don't go through all of this stuff anymore. You know, I'm just going to say this because I think it'll help some people. This will really agitate some of you, but I'm leaving tomorrow, so that's okay. (laughs) But all of the messianic stuff that's going on today, trying to get back under the rituals and observe the Passover and do all of these feast days. Some people are preaching that this makes you closer to God and it gives you greater anointing and stuff. This is what the book of Hebrews is trying to get you away from. There's nothing wrong with being a Jewish Christian and recognizing your roots. And if you want to do that, that's fine. But to preach that this gives you a foot up on everybody else, a leg up, somehow or another, you're closer to God. You've got more anointing is going back to the law and legalism. It is not a godly thing. And the people who are preaching that you have to have the prayer shawl and you got to touch 39 stripes and all of this stuff. And that somehow or another makes your prayers more effective or putting you back into bondage. That is not what the word of God teaches. This is trying to get you away from all of this legalistic stuff and recognizing we've got a brand new relationship with God. Why would you go back and worship the shadow when we have the reality? The Bible says all of these things were shadows. The Old Testament Sabbath and the rituals and the, the feast days and the dietary laws about eat, not eating pork. It says in Colossians 2, 16 and 17, all of these things were shadows of that which was to come. But we have the reality. You know, if this was a building right here, big old tall building, and you were standing over there and I was over here and you couldn't see me because this building was blocking your view. But if you could see my shadow, if there was a light behind me and if you could see my shadow, that shadow would be really important because it would tell you things about whether I'm standing still, whether I'm moving towards you, whether I'm moving away, whether I'm carrying something in my hand. You know, a shadow could tell you a lot about a person that you can't see. And in the Old Testament, Jesus hadn't come yet. There wasn't the New Testament reality. So the Sabbath, the feast days, the Passover, the Feast of Tabernacles, they all had a symbolism. They all revealed truths that were important and there's still benefit by learning from them today. Sometimes we can, it helps us to understand the reality. But once I walk around the corner and I'm in full view, what would you think if a person came running up and just fell down and hugged my shadow and said, oh, I'm so glad you're here. (laughs) That shadow's okay if I'm not here, but once I'm here, forget the shadow. Deal with the reality and not the shadow. Jesus has come and people are trying to go back to all of the symbolism and get in this when we have the reality on the inside of us. The Bible says, Jesus is my Passover sacrificed for me. Why would I want to leave the Lord's Supper and go back to the Passover? Go back to the shadow instead of the reality. Usually goes over about like that. So he was showing that there's a lot of things that have changed. And in the eighth chapter, he talks about all of these pieces of furniture that were in the tabernacle. And he uses every one of them to show that they have now got a fulfillment in Christ except one. He said this in uh, Hebrews chapter 8. And in, he was describing all of these different pieces, the show bread, the candlesticks, the mercy, the uh, altar of incense and everything. And he says, but in verse six, but now hath he, uh, let's see, that's not the right verse. Where's the verse that says of which we cannot now speak particularly? It's right here. 
anyway. Is it in chapter 9? Oh, here it is. 9 5. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 5. Talking about over it, the cherubs of, of glory shadowing the mercy seat of which we cannot now speak particularly. Every other piece of furniture, he showed you that there was a New Testament counterpart. But when it came to the cherubs that were over the mercy seat in Solomon's temple, these were huge angels. And they stretched forth their wings. It was 60 feet from one wall to the other wall and 60 feet tall. And these cherubs' wings stretched and touched all the way from wall to wall and ceiling to floor. They were huge. You know, sometimes people think of cherubs as being these little fat babies with a harp. (laughs) But the Bible says that God set a cherub at the east end of Eden to protect the way of the tree of life with a flaming sword. Cherubs aren't little fat babies. They're warrior angels. And in the Old Testament, these warrior angels sat on top of the mercy seat. That's where God dwelt, and that's where the high priest would come and put the blood, and that's where God meant with men. You know what the cherubs were all about? If you came in without the proper sacrifice, if you didn't do everything right, if you weren't totally purged, they killed you. I actually have read this. I've had other people say it's not so, but I read in a commentary that uh, Josephus talked about that they would tie a rope around the high priest's ankle. And when he went in to offer this sacrifice, they had this rope around his ankle that dangled out into the, uh, you know, outside of the holy, most holy place. Because if he wasn't pure, God would strike him dead and nobody could go get him. And they'd just drag him out. There are examples, the 10th chapter of the book of Leviticus, where two of Aaron's sons offered strange fire. They didn't do it the way God told them to, and God killed them immediately. In the Old Testament, the the cherubs were there to show you that you couldn't approach God if you had any sin in your life. And they were there, and there was a veil that separated from the holy place from the holy of holies. And this veil was so strong it had gold woven through the fabric so that uh, Josephus wrote that a chariot of horses pulling in opposite directions couldn't rend that veil. It was so strong. It was reinforced with gold all through the thing. And it separated people from the presence of God. And you could only go into the holy place one time a year, only one person, the high priest, after he had offered sacrifices for himself and then for the people. And it was a very restricted way. And if you tried to get in there, these cherubs would kill you. You know why he says we can't talk of them now? Because the veil has been written to from the top to the bottom. Has paid for our sins, and now you can come running boldly into the throne room of God and say, Abba, Father. And there is no punishment of sin because Jesus bore your sin, and now we don't have cherubs separating us from God. You could walk right up to God, and if an angel tried to get in your way and say, Wait a minute, who are you? You could say, Get out of my way in Jesus' name because you have been cleansed and purged, and your sin will not separate you from God. Man, this is awesome. People just skip over that. Probably most of you don't have that verse underlined. That is one of the greatest passages of Scripture that God is no longer imputing sins unto us. He's not killing you if you have something wrong in your life. And this is the context of what he's saying. And so he goes on down in Hebrews chapter 9. And in verse 11, he says, But Christ, being come a high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building. What he's doing here is contrasting. He's saying the Old Testament tabernacle and temple were incomplete. They were just symbolisms. We got something better. You are the temple of God. God lives in you. We got something better than the Old Testament tabernacle. And it says in verse 12, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Again, if you were to take this in its context, it would be even more powerful. 
But he's showing how things change from the way it was done in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, every time you sinned, you had to bring a sacrifice and offer this sacrifice to remind yourself that there has to be death for sin. And instead of you dying, God allowed us to kill this animal and symbolize that somebody else was going to substitute for us. And it says right here that the bloods of bulls and goats could never take away sin. It was only symbolic. And it was for us to remind us that, man, our sin causes death. And there was coming a sacrifice that the Lamb of God would come, Jesus. But in the Old Testament, every time you sinned, you had to offer a sacrifice. But in the New Testament, Jesus entered in once, once into the holy place. The emphasis is, is contrasting. In the Old Testament, it was done over and over and over and over. But in the New Testament, one sacrifice for sins forever. God has ended sin. He paid for the sin of the entire world. You do not lose your holiness and your righteousness and your right standing with God every time you sin. Some of you are giving me that deer in the headlights look like you're just stunned. How could this be? Because this is contrary to everything we've been told. It just keeps on saying, look, it says he obtained eternal redemption. Most people believe he got momentary redemption till the next time you sin. And then you got to be, get it under the blood and get that blood, that sin redeemed for. He obtained eternal redemption. What part of eternal redemption do we not understand? I know some of you think this isn't what I've been taught. Well, this is what the Bible says. The problem is most people don't let the Bible get in the way of what they believe. (laughs) This is what I've been taught my whole life. How dare you counter what I've been taught? Don't, Don't let the Bible get in the way of anything. The Bible says he entered in once and obtained eternal redemption. If that means that the moment you get born again, if you go out and sin again, that you lose your salvation. This is what the Pentecostals believe. You lose your salvation every time you sin and you're what they call backslid, which there's only a couple of times the word backslid is used in the Bible and it's talking about a backslidden heifer. (laughs) We've made it into a religious terminology talking about this person's backslid and it's code word for that means they were saved, but they've lost it because they've sinned and they hadn't repented. And if they were to die in a backslidden state, they would go to hell even though they've been born again for 20, 30, 40 years. That's not eternal redemption. I know that I'm rubbing some of you the wrong way, but I'm just telling you what the Bible says. Eternal redemption, not redemption until the next time you sin. And then you got to be redeemed again. You got to be born again, again. Some people get save loss, save loss, save loss every time. You just don't know and you wonder where they truly say. If you're saved, you're saved. And then it says in verse 13, for the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctified to the purifying of the flesh. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit, offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? This sin consciousness where every time you sin, you've lost your relationship. You got to pray through and beg God to come back. And oh God, would you please accept me back? And I'm so sorry. Those are dead works. And this should cleanse your conscience from dead works so that you can serve the living God. You can't serve God with that sin consciousness. I'm amazed at how many Christians are just absolutely paralyzed. And there's very little effect of the power of God in their life. And yet they're born again. They love God. And yet they're just paralyzed. And you wonder, how could this be? Sin consciousness will render you completely uh, so that you can't serve the living God. You're just constantly feeling unworthy. And you know God exists and has power, but he wouldn't do it for you because you don't deserve it. That is being taught big time in churches today. In verse 15, and for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Eternal inheritance means you aren't just 
a son and have an inheritance until the next time you sin and then you lose it and then you got to get it again and get born again again. This means you got eternal inheritance as in never quitting inheritance as in you don't lose it the next time you sin inheritance. And I've got a lot to say, so I'm going to have to skip through. But if you keep reading this, there are five times in the ninth chapter that he makes the contrast. In the Old Testament, they had to offer sacrifices over and over and over every time you sin. In the New Testament, once, once. If you don't believe this, just tear Hebrews chapter 9 out of your Bible. (laughs) Either believe it or tear it out of your Bible. Look at this in verse uh, 23. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavenly should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true. There was a true temple in heaven and the tabernacle was given by God. He, He told Moses, he says, see you make it according to the pattern that you saw in the mountain. Moses literally got a view into heaven and saw the temple that's in heaven and made the Old Testament tabernacle like the temple in heaven. But the earthly tabernacle and then the temple of Solomon were made with hands. They were just figures and patterns of the true. But there is a true temple in heaven. And this is what it's talking about. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor yet that he should offer himself often. As the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with the blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. This is saying that if Jesus had to reapply his blood every time you blew it. And you came and oh God I put this sin under the blood. Oh God forgive me of this sin. If he had to reapply the blood and get you born again again. And make an atonement for you every time you sin then there'd be no such thing as Jesus sitting on the right hand of God. He would be constantly working. Just imagine there are billions of Christians on the face of the earth repenting of sins over and over and over every day. It would be physically impossible for Jesus to be forgiving billions of sins being confessed every single 24 hour period. There'd be no such thing as sitting on the right hand of the Father. He isn't up there just... If if that's the way it was, there would be impossible. He would just be constantly forgiving sins. But it says, it goes on to say in that verse, But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Again, it's making a contrast. Instead of this thing where he's just constantly getting up and reapplying his blood and forgiving this sin and forgiving this sin and this and this and this and this and he's just constantly forgiving sins... One time at the end of the world, he put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. One sacrifice for sin, for everybody, for all times. Sin has been atoned for. Boy, that is awesome. That is awesome. And it says in the next verse, And as it is appointed unto man once to die, but after this the judgment, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Once he was offered. Once. This whole concept that God forgives you up until the point you get saved. And then every time you sin, you got to get that re-forgiven. You got to add that to it. You got to confess it, get it under the blood and get constantly cleansed and forgiven is a religious concept that isn't borne out by the word of God. God has forgiven you once and for all. You know, I, I hate to do this, but I'm going to have to skip through some verses. Let me just mention the last part of verse chapter two. It says, if there could have been a sacrifice given under the old Testament, which would have really worked, The people would have quit offering sacrifices because the worshipers, once purged, would have had no more conscience of sin. Now, under the Old Testament, that couldn't happen because bloods of bulls and of goats couldn't truly save us. It was just symbolic. But in the New Testament, we have a sacrifice that did work and therefore we should have no more conscience of sin 
you shouldn't be sin conscious. You shouldn't constantly go around reminding yourself how sorry you are and how much you failed. Sin consciousness makes you focus on it and you will wind up actually committing more sin by being sin conscious than if you start thinking about who you are in Christ. There's a lot of people that resist things. They'll re- resist adultery or pornography or something. But you know what the problem is? They say, but I'm an old sinner saved by grace. But I'm an old sinner and this is my nature and I'm just so ungodly and I've failed so many. And you think that way and you know what? It makes you weak. And so you only resist to a portion. And then after a while, I'm, that's my nature. I'm just an old sinner. And you wind up giving in to it and you hate it. And you're miserable, but that's who you are. But if you could see that, no, that's not who I am. I'm a new person in Christ and that is not me. This is not the way I am. As you think in your heart, so are you. Proverbs 23, 7. If you would see yourself that I'm alive unto God, I'm not this old person anymore. I don't enjoy adultery and pornography and this stuff. That's not me. And if you started seeing yourself holy and pure, guess what? You would wind up living holy and pure. But you see yourself a failure. You see yourself terrible. And this is who you are. And because of it, you just give token resistance. And then after a while, give in. Because after all, that's who you are. You're a failure. Man, you need to change that and say that, no, I'm a new person in Christ Jesus. You should have no more sin consciousness. And then it talks about Jesus died and then rose from the dead to enforce his own will. He's the only person that ever enforces his own last will and testament. And in verse 10, it says, By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. The emphasis, it's still the same thing. Men are the ones that put the chapter and verse divisions in there. He's making the same points. He's contrasting the way it was done. In the Old Testament, there was constant sin consciousness. Every time you sinned, you had to come back and get repurged, re-cleansed. But in the New Testament, one sacrifice for sins forever. And it says that we have uh, been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Some people think, well, that's once for all people. No, it's once for all time. If you keep reading, look at the next couple of verses. Verse 11, it says, and every priest is still making a contrast with the way it was done, with the way it's supposed to be done. Sad to say. It's still being done this way in most people's lives. Most people don't believe that they're free from sin. They believe they were freed from sin, but I've sinned since then, and now I'm back under the dominion of sin. We don't understand that it's once for all. And so it says in verse 11, every priest standeth daily. You could say most preachers standing in church today are offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which could never take away sins. They're still having people repent of dead works and go back and get cleansed over and over and over again. That would be just as accurate as what he's saying right here. Every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever... This isn't just one sacrifice for the whole human race. One sacrifice for sins forever. Talking about length of time. He does not have to reapply his blood. You don't have to get forgiven over and over and over and over and over. You were forgiven of one one time forgave you of all sins, even the ones you hadn't committed yet. I know that this is troubling to some people, but if you can receive it, it's awesome. It's awesome to think that, man, how could God treat me this way? Because he's good. He's, uh, he placed all of his wrath on Jesus. In verse 13, it says, From henceforth, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering, he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Verse 10 says, You were sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Verse 14 says, if you were sanctified, which you were, then you have been perfected forever. You're perfect forever. And people struggle with this because they go look in the mirror and they think this is perfect. (laughs) They search their mind. 
around and they go, this is perfect. The Bible is so hard to understand. It's not talking about your body. It's not talking about your soul. Our body's not redeemed. We are going to get a glorified body. Our soul's not redeemed. We will know all things, even as also we are known. But your spirit is a brand new creation. And in the spirit, you are sanctified and perfect forever. I can prove that to you by the 12th chapter. Remember that men are the ones that put the chapter in verse divisions. This is the same author. It's the same book. It's the same point being made. And in chapter 12 and in verse 22, it says, But you are come unto Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. It's your spirit that was made perfect. Your body's not perfect. Your body's got bulges and zits and things that it shouldn't have. Your mind isn't perfect. You don't always think the way that you should. You don't know all things, but your little spirit is perfect. It is perfect. It's identical to Jesus. As Jesus is, so are we in this world. 1 John 4, 17. You're perfect. You're perfect. What part of perfect do we not understand? You're perfect. And God is a spirit. John 4, 24. And if we worship him, we must worship him in spirit. And in truth, the part of you that is sanctified and perfected forever, that has no sin in it. And if you were to approach him on the basis of who you are in the spirit, not based on the basis of who you are in the flesh, then you wouldn't come in talking about, oh God, I failed you. Oh God, I'm so unworthy. Oh God, how could you love me? God, I know you can do things, but would you do it for me? That's a carnal person that is approaching God in the flesh If you approach him in the spirit, I don't care if you've messed up big time. Your spirit is sanctified and perfected forever. And you can walk right into the presence of God and say, God, I blew it again, but I am still righteous. Thank you, Jesus, for my salvation. Thank you that I didn't lose your love, that I haven't lost your anointing. Thank you that you aren't going to give me what I deserve because in the spirit I'm sanctified and holy and perfected. And you could worship God. Look over here in Ephesians chapter 1. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. It says, In whom we trusted, after that we... Her, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. This word sealed here, there's different ways that you could do a seal. You know, they have a good housekeeping seal that they'll stick on things and it means that they've inspected it and they put their reputation on it. And so a seal can be a recommendation or something like that. But also, this is talking about a seal like you seal something to keep out impurities. Like a woman will... Uh, make preserves and put it in a jar that is airtight and then put paraffin over the top and seal it so that airborne impurities don't get in. This is talking about you were sealed with the Holy Spirit to keep any impurities from getting into that born again spirit. When you were born again, you were created righteous and truly holy. Ephesians 4, 24. You were identical to Jesus. 1 Corinthians 6, 17. 1 John chapter uh, 4, verse 17. And you were sanctified and perfected forever. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 10 and 14. And Hebrews 12, 23 says it was your spirit that was made perfect. That's what happened to you at salvation. You were instantly perfected and forgiven of all sin. And at that moment, you were vacuum packed, sealed by the Holy Spirit. Amen. And no impurity ever penetrates that seal. If you go out and sin as a Christian, you let the devil have access to your body. You could have sickness and disease. You let the devil have access to your mind and your emotions. You could be condemned. And it's stupid to live in sin. Quit living in sin and giving Satan freedom and access to you. 
I'm not encouraging that, but I'm saying he can get into your body and into your soul, but he cannot penetrate the seal that is around your spirit. You retain your righteousness and holiness. And even if you have acted like an unbeliever and done something terrible, your spirit is still sealed by the Holy Spirit. And God is a spirit and he sees you in the spirit and you're pure and you're holy. And you can come boldly before the throne of grace, Hebrews 4, 16, that you might obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Not when you've done everything right, but when you've blown it, you can still come boldly before the throne of grace. If you aren't coming boldly before God and standing and claiming what is rightfully yours and feeling justified in doing it, but instead you're condemned and you feel so inadequate. You are in the flesh. You aren't in the spirit. In your spirit, there is no impurity. There's nothing wrong. You're perfect. You are his workmanship. It says Ephesians chapter two, verse eight, by, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. In verse 10, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. In the spirit, you are his workmanship. You're perfect. You're pure. There is nothing wrong with you. And yet very few Christians ever reach this place to where they just feel one with the Lord. Charlie has a song he wrote about that that's awesome. Oh, what a joy it is to be one with the Lord. Very few Christians know that because they're trying to become one in the flesh in their body and in their actions and in their emotions. And I'm telling you, as long as you're in a fallen world, something's going to be wrong with you. Something will be wrong. You will have some thought. Some of you don't think that. You think that you can reach this place of perfection to where you never have a thought, you never have any fear, you never have any discouragement. I just don't believe it exists. I've been seeking the Lord with all my heart. And you know what? If I wanted to, if I just is to take my eyes off of Jesus, I can fall as fast as anybody. It's like flying in a plane. You know, you get to flying in a plane 500 miles an hour, 39,000 feet and think, look what I'm doing. But that's not you doing it. It's that plane doing it. And it's your position in that plane that allows you to fly. And if you don't believe it, step outside of the plane. See what happens. <laughs> you step outside of Christ. You get outside of the spirit and you get to try to relate to God on your flesh and you will fall again. You will have problems. Any person in here can mess up. But in Christ Jesus, you are a new creature. Old things have passed away. You, one sacrifice perfected you forever in your spirit. You have been made perfect. There is no more sacrifice for sin. There's nothing to be done except to just say thank you. And then when you do mess up, you know, some people say, well, if you preach this, people are just going to go live in sin. They're going to take this as an opportunity to go live in sin. Paul dealt with this same thing. There's four different times Paul taught on this exact same thing. And every time he had to say, what am I saying? Can you just continue in sin? You know, if you don't have that question come up, if somebody doesn't say, well, are you just saying that people can live in sin and it doesn't matter? If that question never comes up, then you haven't heard the gospel that Paul preached because he dealt with that constantly. And you know what that says? That most of us have not heard the true gospel. We haven't heard the gospel that Paul preached. But here's the way that he answered this. He gave two answers in Romans chapter 6. The first thing he said in Romans 6, 1, he says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Verse 2, God forbid. In the Hebrew or in the Greek, that's as close to profanity as you can get. It is just an absolute unqualified negative. No, 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 that's not what I'm saying. God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein. Don't you know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ were, were baptized into his death? So the first reason he gives, you're dead to sin. If you were living in the spirit, if you were focused on who you are in Christ, there is nothing in the spirit that will drive you to sin. It has nothing but a desire to live holy. Yes. It says in 1 John chapter 3, man, I'm out of time. 
First John chapter three, verses one through three, it says, behold, what manner of love the father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knows us not because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when we shall see him, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. Or when he appears, we will be like him for we will see him as he is. And then verse three says, and every man that has this hope in him purifies himself, even as he is pure. If you are truly born again, you have the drive to live holy. You may be doing a poor job of it because the law actually strengthens sin. First Corinthians 15, 56. So you may be doing a poor job of living holy, but if you are a Christian, you don't want to live in sin. And any person who would take what I'm saying and say, man, this is awesome. I can go live in sin. You ought to get born again. (laughs) You aren't saved. You're just religious. And then the second reason in Romans chapter six, verse 16, it says, know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey his servants, ye are to whom, whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. So here's the second reason that you don't live in sin. Because if you live in sin, you're giving Satan access to your body and to your soul. And Satan only comes to steal, kill, and destroy. John chapter 10, verse 10. So you don't want to give Satan access to you like that. You're stupid if you live in sin. Quit living in sin. Quit rebelling at God. But God loves you, stupid, because he's looking at your spirit that isn't stupid that is redeemed and it's sanctified and perfected forever. And God's love for you is the same, but you are just letting Satan come in and destroy your life. How dumb can you get and still breathe? Quit living in sin. Amen. But when you do miss it, recognize that, Oh God, I'm still righteous. I was sanctified and perfected forever. You aren't mad at me. I didn't lose anything. Thank you, father, for your grace and your goodness. Man, if you could understand what I've talked about last night and today, this would revolutionize your life. You would never be the same. It would transform you completely. Thank you, Jesus. If you aren't born again, what a great message to get born again on. Man, that ought to make you want to be sanctified and perfected forever. And the sacrifice has already been made. All you've got to do is receive it by making Jesus your Lord. If you've never made Jesus your Lord, you ought to be born again. And if you're born again, then you need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that you receive power after the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And one of the greatest things about the baptism of the Holy Spirit is he teaches you all things and leads you into all truth. You know, there are many of you here today that this is just like from outer space compared to where you live. You have never heard these things. This is just off the charts. And you aren't going to be able to retain this if you lean under your own understanding. You need the Holy Spirit to interpret this and to apply it to your life and to expand on it. I've touched, I just touched the tip of the iceberg. There are thousands of scriptures that make these points that I've talked about today. And without the quickening power of the Holy Spirit, you cannot retain it. One of the greatest things that happens when you receive the Holy Spirit is he starts giving you revelation knowledge. It comes out of your spirit, not out of your brain. You need that. If you don't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which includes speaking in tongues, it includes many things. But if you don't speak in tongues, you need this baptism of the Holy Spirit. If that's you today, and if you either need to be born again, you need to be changed and receive this part of you that's sanctified and perfected forever, or if you've already been born again, but if you need the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I'd like to ask you to raise your hand right now and let me pray with you and help you to receive one or both of those. Amen. Anybody? Here's people over here. There's people all over this auditorium. We've already had, I think it's 200 and 21 people baptized in the Holy Spirit in like seven or eight uh, born again. And praise God, there's still people wanting to receive. Isn't that awesome? You know, if you raised your hand or if you were supposed to raise your hand, would you just come forward right now and let us pray with you and minister to you? We want you to be able to receive right now here today. Praise God. 
you, Jesus. Just come stand right down here. Praise God, brother. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you, Jesus. Isn't this great? Praise the Lord. Just stand here beside each other. Don't get behind each other because I'm going to have people come up and stand behind you and lay hands on you. Praise the Lord. This is just awesome. Let me remind you that we're having a meeting here in just the next five or ten minutes down here in the, what is it, Lake Heart? room. It's down across from their boutique that they have, up the escalators, down the hall, about the Bible college. If you've ever had a desire for the Bible college, you ought to go. Even if you don't have a desire, go and we'll give you one. Amen. It's awesome. Praise the Lord. So don't forget that. Wendell will be down there in just the next five or ten minutes. You know, here's what I'd like to do this morning. This is really important what's happening with you, but you know what? I really want, I know that there is a huge interest in this Bible school. I want to give everybody the opportunity to go. So what I'm going to ask is if um, Melinda and some of her helpers would take you into this room. They will pray with you, help you to receive either salvation or, and or the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They're going to give you a book and there's people that will minister to you, but this will speed things up and enable them, uh, enable people to get to this meeting. Is that okay with you? These people are awesome people. They'll love you. So right here is Melinda. If you would just follow Melinda, she will pray with you and help you to receive. Let's go this way and follow Melinda. She'll just take a few moments and you'll be able to come back. God bless you, brother. Praise the Lord. Amen. Isn't this awesome? I believe that people are going to receive this baptism of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. If I could have our prayer ministers come forward. If you need healing or something, you know what? Your faith has been quick. And I quoted that verse earlier out of Philemon chapter 1, verse 6. It says, the communication of your faith becomes effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing that's in you. Some of you have acknowledged. You've seen to a greater detail what's on the inside of you. And now you are ready to believe God. Your faith is strong. And if you would like someone to agree with you, these are our prayer ministers right here. And we will pray with you and see a miracle. So if you would like prayer for anything, just come forward right now and let one of our prayer ministers lay hands on you and agree with you. We're going to have people that will stand at the aisles that will direct you towards them. But if you need prayer, come forward right now and let us pray with you. The rest, if you'd wait just a minute, Let these people get into the aisles and then I'll dismiss you. You can go to this meeting. Also remember that we have all of the materials out there. And uh, we have our three, or let's see, it's four services now. Are already duplicated on DVD and CD. You can go out there and get those services that we've had. And remember that tonight we start at 6 o'clock, not 7 o'clock. I've got the best to share tonight. I'm going to share some stuff with you tonight that is going to change your life. Amen. So thanks for coming. You're dismissed. If you need prayer, come forward and let one of our people here just pray with you and agree with you and come back tonight. You're dismissed.